Welcome, everyone. Uh, I am Phil Forsyth, one of the co-executive directors of the Philadelphia Orchard Project. Uh, I know we have some new faces tonight, so just briefly, um, POP, as we call it, the Philadelphia Orchard Project is a nonprofit that plants and supports community orchards in the city of Philadelphia. We're actually celebrating our 15th year this year and currently supporting 67 community orchards in Philadelphia. And uh, we're always trying out new things. And we think of uh, any perennial plant as an orchard plant. So that includes not only fruit and nut trees, but berry bushes, fruiting vines, uh, perennial flowers, herbs, and perennial vegetables. And so I look forward to learning with all of you tonight and thinking about some new possibilities to plant in, in orchard sites across the city. Uh, just briefly want to, to mention before I hand it off to Nate, uh, Eric visited us, I think, in our first year, maybe second year, back 2007 or 2008. So kind of fun to bring it full circle and really glad to uh, that he's able to join us tonight and um, and share some some new knowledge for us to think about. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to POP board member Nate Kleinman of Experimental Farm Network to do a proper intro of Eric. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm uh, currently sort of on the side of the road because I'm traveling right now in um, northern Pennsylvania, White Haven. Um, so I um, was really excited when I heard this was going to happen because um, Eric is somebody who uh, really helped inspire the, the work that I'm doing right now with Experimental Farm Network. Um, we are a nonprofit based in Philadelphia. I, I farm down in the southern reaches of Lenape country in southern New Jersey. Um, and uh, our purpose when we, when we started was to facilitate collaboration on plant breeding and sustainable ag research projects, especially focused on developing perennial crops for fighting climate change. Um, and uh, I, I'm not sure I would have taken that path if I had not um, had the for, fortuitous uh, um, chance to hear Eric speak at uh, a permaculture event in Quebec in the summer of 2013. Um, the topic of his talk then was perennial industrial crops. And um, I had known a lot about the, the potentials of perennial, uh, perennial staple crops, the attempts to develop perennial wheat over the last century uh, in particular, and then certain other crops I was already a bit familiar with. Um, but to hear Eric go through all of these amazing plants and um, time and again, he would say this, this, uh, you know, this, this plant has so much potential, but, you know, we're maybe 10 years away from, from being able to do that with it. We need to, there needs to be more work put in on, uh, on these plants. Um, things like uh, everything from uh, Osage orange fruits, using the, using the fruits as a source of edible starch after some processing to um, things like cramby, the, uh, which is the Latin name for sea kale. And uh, sea kale has some oil seed relatives. So thinking about producing um, non-edible oils that could be used and, and replace petroleum products uh, from perennial plants. Um, it just uh, sparked my imagination. And I, and I, you know, I, I thought, well, how are we gonna, how are we gonna make these things happen? Because a lot of, there wasn't a ton of money being put into it, wasn't a ton of, um, of institutional heft behind it. So really the, the idea to, to start the Experimental Farm Network uh, really came to me in that apple orchard up there in Quebec after hearing Eric talk um, and thinking, well, if we, can, if we can get people collaborating on a massive scale um, to develop these things without a, uh, without a capitalist profit incentive um, and, and uh, make sure that, you know, we really treat these, the efforts to develop these things into viable crops as a generational project, something that's not gonna happen in any one person's lifetime, then we might just be able to, to use plants uh, as a real weapon against climate change and, and against the environmental degradation that we're dealing with across the planet. Um, so um, since then I've been, I've uh, really enjoyed following Eric uh, he, he at that point he had published a book called Paradise Lot, and I think Perennial Vegetables was uh, was was new then or or was about to come out. 
the carbon farming uh, solution came out soon after that. Um, he's got a number of really wonderful books that you should check out if you haven't. And, um, and he continues to do um, amazing uh, community-based work in Massachusetts. Uh, I'm sure he'll talk some about that. So I won't, uh, won't belabor this introduction any further. And um, yeah, without further ado, uh, my friend, Eric Tonesmeyer. Thanks so much, Eric. Sure. Um, it's so nice. I wish uh, everybody who comes to my talks would go start a new organization. That would be <laughs> great. Um, well, uh, well, thanks, uh, Nate, for that. And um, thanks to the Philly Orchard Project for having me. I, I live um, in Massachusetts, but I grew up in Philadelphia. And it was at the Schuylkill Center that I first was exposed to permaculture in like 1989. So um, my roots in all this are, are in Philadelphia, although I've been up here for a long time and I will continue to be here um, for the foreseeable future. Um, let's see. OK, so um, I'll, I'll slide share here. Um, we're going to walk through some some basics on perennial vegetables and what they are. We're gonna uh, look at some examples. We're gonna look at their nutritional um, uh, uh, content um, and hopefully throw out some new ideas. I won't talk about all the perennial vegetables you can grow in Philadelphia because there's almost 300 of them or, or maybe more, but we'll, we'll go through and um, and talk about them and, and I've tried in doing this to think in particular about urban gardens. I worked in urban agriculture here in Massachusetts for about 16 or 17 years. And I also meanwhile had my own urban garden all that time. Um, it's a 45 foot by 90 foot garden. Um, I just moved in March to a farm right outside the city here uh, that has five acres. So I have a lot more land to work with. So we'll see how all that, all that goes. Um, so, okay, what's a perennial vegetable? First, it's perennial, meaning it lives for at least three years and it may live for a very, very, very long time. Um, it's not, uh, it doesn't require tillage for harvest. So at this point, I don't consider root crops to be really perennial. You can, something like sunchokes or whatever, or, or some of the cold hardy potatoes, you can dig, divide, and replant some and harvest them. But to me, that's not quite perennial in the same way in terms of soil carbon and stuff. Um, not that there's anything wrong with those. I grow those things too, but um, it includes woody plants and vines and herbs. So all different kinds of perennials, every kind of perennial you can think of, there's probably a perennial vegetable, even some that grow completely submerged underwater. Hmm. Uh, and what's a vegetable? Well. Um, actually, there is no functional definition of what a vegetable is as far as botanists are concerned, but really it means something that we would would cook and serve as a side dish with dinner uh, or eat raw in a salad. And it would be either the vegetative parts like leaves and shoots and stuff or the reproductive parts. In some cases, the flowers, flower buds, um, ripe or unripe fruit, if it's not sweet or sour. Uh, and sometimes unripe seeds like corn on the cob is a vegetable. Um, and I'm trying to separate out the starchy things, separate out dessert fruits and really focus on, okay, a tomato is botanically a fruit, but it's a vegetable in terms of how we eat it. An eggplant is the same way. A winter squash or a zucchini is the same way. So we're looking for perennial analogs, perennial versions of those kinds of things. And they have benefits to the farm or your garden. Many of them are quite easy to grow. Um, like in this photo, that's a linden tree, <coughs> which is a very nice vegetable. This is Martin Crawford, who's a, who wrote a wonderful perennial vegetable book. Um, and uh, he just cuts it down to this height every three or four years. And that's all he does. It doesn't need any spraying. It doesn't need any fertilizing. It just grows and he harvests the leaves and that's it. Um, so we're, I do, some of them do take work, um, but many of them are very easy to grow, which is great. Um, a lot of them will grow in places where regular vegetables can't grow, like wet places or extremely dry places or shady places. 
Um, a real big benefit is that they most of our perennial vegetables for temperate climates are harvested in a season when annual vegetables aren't producing anything. Um, so we'll look at the seasonal calendar. Um, and some of them have like basically no pests and diseases because they don't, they're mostly not in the same families, botanical families as the vegetables we grow, like, you know, brassicas and tomato family and the squash family and so on. Many of these are like Linden is totally unrelated to any of those things, making it um, uh, um, not vulnerable to those common pests and diseases of our of our vegetable gardens. And we can grow these in lots of ways. Uh, they can grow in the shade under fruit trees. They can, the vines can grow on a fence. Um, they make a nice, some of them are very beautiful in an herbaceous border, like around the edge of a community garden or the edge of a park. Um, the trees, which are coppice that are cut down and pruned for resprouting, which is mostly what we do with the trees with edible leaves, like in this last photo here, we cut them either at the ground or, or maybe, uh, you know, four to six feet off the ground. Um, those can make a really nice hedgerow or edge um, around plantings, including in, in community gardens. Um, they're very, very suitable to all kinds of uh, food forestry uh, and also to commercial agroforestry systems. This photo is from Denmark, where um, there's a small operation called Morris Permaculture Haven, excuse me, who have like a two acre market garden of perennial vegetables and fruits that they sell. So lots of ways to do it. They, um, just an example of some of the species for shade. Um, there's lots of good ones. These are just a few. And this, um, you'll all get a copy of this slide set. So I won't go through and read them all, but this is just to say there are lots of them that will grow in at least partial shade and some really in full shade. The one on the left there is one of my favorites. That's Mioga ginger, Zingiber Mioga which is actually hardy here in Massachusetts. It has taken 15 degrees below zero here. My plants are now about 10 years old. And in the spring, you eat the shoots. Um, and in the fall, like in September, I was just looking today and they're not ready yet, are these flower buds that you can see in that upper photo. Um, they grow right at the base of the plant and they are um, used in uh, with sushi and in soups. They're sort of like a... Um, they're sort of crisp and firm and gingery flavored and the shoots in the spring are amazing. They're like gingery asparagus or scallions. I really, really love them. So this is commercially grown as a shade vegetable in Japan. It does grow here and yet we mostly do nothing with it. So a great example. I think it's a pretty looking plant too. There's even a variegated one that wasn't hardy here, but it would be worth trying in Philly. Um, really cool plant. So lots of great shade shade plants. Um, there are also lots of great native perennial vegetables. These are just some just some examples of some of the native perennial vegetables uh, of the Philadelphia area, the greater Philadelphia area. Um, really lots to choose from, lots and lots to choose from if you're interested in, um, in native plants. And I always like to start with those and then build out from there. Um, these are species that grow in urban conditions. This book right here, uh, Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast, is a really great guide to the eco urban ecosystems and the plants that grow in them. And these are a bunch that are mostly listed in there, but also some that you just see around in Philly, like Devil's Walking Stick, um, which is almost the same as a species that's commercially grown in South Korea. Um, and yet we're not doing much with it here. Um, so uh, there are lots of great, now, just because they grow in the city doesn't mean you wanna wild harvest those because they may be in soil that's wildly poisonous for one reason or the other from contamination. But the fact that they will grow in urban soils is an indicator that they could be a good choice for uh, uh, urban gardens and orchards and so on. And then some aquatic species. These can be grown in ponds, they can be grown in artificial ponds, they can be grown in aquaponics, lots of different ways. Um, the ones that are not native, I think especially should not be grown in natural bodies of water because they can spread really quickly in water. Um, um, 
And this book, uh, Edible Water Gardens by Romanowski is, is still, I think, like the best thing that's been written on the on the subject that I've that I've seen anywhere. Um, Arrowhead, I particularly love the, the greens of also has really nice edible tubers. Um, and there's a bunch of others. Some of these are among our most nutritious vegetables as well. Um, aquatic plants are often uh, highly, highly nutritious. And they're super beautiful too. So a little pond, you know, it attracts the dragonflies and uh, always ladybugs are breeding in ours. Um, and uh, all the birds want to come and drink there and stuff. So it's a great element for, for beneficial wildlife that also is beautiful and also can produce food. So um, in other parts of the world, it's very, very, very common to grow aquatic vegetables. And we just don't, um, by and large, we don't take full advantage of that here um, in this part of the U.S. So, okay, it sounds great. What can go wrong? Well, it can be hard to get them. I do have a slide at the end with sources. Um, they're more expensive because you're often not buying seed. You're often buying plants, although some of them will grow from seed. Um, some of them are hard to propagate. Some of them are super weedy. Whether they're native or not, they can be super weedy. Uh, and some of them are certainly invasive. Some are thorny. This photo right here actually is that um, is the, uh, the Asian analog to that um, uh, devil's walking stick or prickly ash. I don't know what they call it there. Aurelia spinosa. Um, that's under, that's taken over the entire understory of Fairmount Park. Um, those shoots in the spring are eaten and, um, and, and, and the, the, the very similar, sometimes considered the same species, Aurelia alata, um, is commercially grown in South Korea. And I think also in Japan as well, certainly an important wild edible in Japan. Um, some of them taste really different from things we're used to. Some of them have to be processed so they don't make you sick. Like they need to be boiled twice or they, um, uh, uh, like nettles you have to cook or they'll sting you sort of stuff. So there are a lot, plenty of challenges. Um, and um, some of them aren't all that productive, but many of them really are. I've been quite impressed. Um, I don't think of them as a replacement for annual vegetables. I still grow tomatoes, I grow carrots, I grow, you know, all those things. But they're complementary in so many ways, particularly in the season in which they're ready. They're very complementary. Oops. So there's lots of them. In temperate climates around the world, in Philadelphia-like climates around the world, there are over 270 species grown as vegetables and there are hundreds more that could and should that could be and some of them should be anyway um so there's lots and lots and lots of of perennial vegetables um when i first wrote that book about them i thought they were sort of like an almost a novelty plant or like something people should consider trying but it turns out that they're it's an idea that's come up again and again and again almost everywhere in the world that we should bring these plants into cultivation. Uh, but never at a huge scale, except for a few of them in this climate, like asparagus and rhubarb and so on. Um, so let's talk about their nutrition for a minute. Um, I focused, I wrote a paper about this a couple years ago, uh, a, a, like a fancy scientific paper where we looked at particularly the nutrients that human beings are missing from our diets. There are, maybe 3 billion people who aren't getting enough nutrients um, to be healthy. And that's sort of divided into two categories. One they call traditional malnutrition, um, which uh, you don't see so much um, in the mainland uh, uh, US, um, but we do have a set of industrial diet deficiencies here. That is a very serious problem in the United States, lack of fiber and calcium and magnesium and various antioxidants that are linked to a number of very serious and very um, uh, uh, widely um, occurring um, um, diseases. So we are very much not eating enough vegetables. Uh, so I analyzed about 330 species of annual and perennial vegetables around the world for their nutrition, not directly, but just pulling from the literature um, to see how perennial vegetables compare with annuals and how they compare with the annuals you can actually buy in the store 
for their nutritional content, for their ability to meet these particular sets of deficiencies that, that affect so many people, billions of people. Um, and it was very interesting to see that a number of the perennial vegetables and a few of the annuals uh, have much higher levels of these nutrients than the vegetables you can buy in the store, much, much higher. Um, in some cases for many nutrients and the group with the highest number of these um, multi-nutrient species is trees with edible leaves. In that sense, they could be called the most nutritious class of vegetables in the world, even though not all of them are extremely nutritious and there are some other plants that are also extremely nutritious. Um, as a group, they're absolutely the winners. Um, which is fascinating and maybe not surprising because they have deep roots and they live for many years and so on. Um, uh, and yet they're not really part of our cuisine or our way of life here in the United States very much at all, except in Hawaii and for some folks in South Florida, even though we have very nice ones um, that we can grow almost anywhere in, in the U.S. Um, so these are the winners. These are the species that have... Uh, high levels of multiple nutrients for industrial diet deficiencies. They include milkweed, which actually has 10 times more, sorry, eight times more vitamin C than oranges. Um, edible leaf goji, edible leaf mulberry, uh, dandelion, stinging nettle, Chinese tune, which we'll talk about, grape leaves. So there are quite a few perennial vegetables that are really spectacular at addressing the particular deficiencies that people in the United States have the most, um, and a couple of annuals too, uh, jute leaf, wild arugula, African eggplant leaf, and cowpea leaves or black eyed pea leaves are the annuals that are very, very high um, in those nutrients as well. So it's just a different way to think about vegetables, I guess. Um, all right, okay, so that was perennial vegetables in general. Uh, and then we had the nutrition. Now let's look at the, um, the seasonality. This is a really key. Um, this is in my own garden, my, my previous garden. You can see on the right there in um, spring, summer, and winter. Um, uh, what's our seasonal calendar look like? Well, in November through March, so really winter time, we do have one or two perennial vegetables that produce well outside, and I'll show, talk more about that in the next slide. Starting in April, we get lots of shoots and leaves coming in. Um, by May, we're really full on in, in perennial vegetable season. Uh, meanwhile, our annual vegetables outdoors really aren't doing anything yet in April. There are, some of them are starting in May. Some of them are kicking in in June nicely. Um, and then um, July through September, we have, you know, your tomatoes and beans and all that kind of stuff. And during the summer, a lot of the perennial vegetables, the herbaceous perennial vegetables that aren't woody, but the ones that come up and then die back in the winter, they're mostly done by the end of May or early June. They've ceased being worth eating at that point, and we move into the annual vegetables, but also into the trees with edible leaves, which will then continue for us because we're cutting them down every year and they re-sprout. We get tender growth all the way through September, sometimes into October. Um, uh, and then as October comes around, we do have a few other things here and there a few perennial vegetables going through the summer, but but relatively few. Then in October, they kick in again. So a lot of the cold, um, cold loving ones start up again, the umble family, the allium, some of the brassicas kick in again, and the ground cherries come in at that time, the perennial ground cherries come in at that time. So you can see that there's really something through a much broader uh, growing season and that by and large, it's really uh, at the spring end and at the fall end. Um, so sort of cushioning on either side of the annual vegetable season um, with the exception of the trees with edible leaves and, the, and a few other exceptions like our sea kale broccoli, for example, it's a perennial broccoli. We're eating that like the first week of May. We haven't even planted broccoli yet then in the garden. We haven't, you know, our broccolis might be this tall um, 
and haven't even been planted out yet because we're not even frost free here until around May 15th. And we've already been eating the, the sea kale broccoli, but then it's gone. So by the time regular broccoli, annual broccoli is ready, there's no more sea kale broccoli. So you have just a wider, broader season. Um, and I think that's a really important piece of this, a reason to do it both as a someone who likes to eat fresh vegetables and also for anybody who's thinking about doing uh, market sales, it's nice to have a wider season to sell vegetables in as well. So for winter, there are some that are particularly good. The one that's in the photo here is, is Korean celery or giant oolong celery. Um, it will really come up under the snow, through the snow. It's just the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. Uh, in, in February, we might have a foot of snow, but if there's a thaw and you push the snow aside, it'll grow right up. It'll come up through the snow. Um, it's not the most spectacular vegetable in the world, but it is the only vegetable we have outdoors for three months of the year. Then as the snow melts, we get into the perennial alliums, the Caucasian spinach, which I love. It's a climbing vining spinach. Um, Sylvetta arugula, perennial ground cherry. Perennial ground cherry is late, so it comes on, it ripens in October, and it stays edible and good quality until almost New Year's. Um, so uh, again, that's really cushioning that season. And in Philly, where it's a lot warmer than it is here, you may have an even better um, experience with these vegetables there, because you all have just brown through most of the winter. Um, uh, which I suspect a lot of these would be evergreen for you um, in a climate like that. So let's talk about these trees with edible leaves. We have, let's see how we're doing on time. We're doing great. Okay. Um, trees with edible leaves in, in tropical permaculture, in tropical agroforestry, in tropical backyards around the world, trees with edible leaves are pretty common. Um, but we, it's sort of a crazy idea for many of us here. And there are quite a few uh, in China, um, actually throughout temperate East Asia. So just to touch briefly, we have the lindens, which are sort of, um, they're related to okra. They're a little bit slimy like that. They're great in soups and stews. They have a very mild flavor. Um, the edible leaf goji, which I'll bet is a weed in Philadelphia. It's certainly a weed here. Um, uh, is cultivated as a vegetable um, in China and you eat the whole tender shoot and it's got sort of a, um, a mustardy, nutty, slightly bitter flavor that I, I really like. That's one of our most nutritious leaves in the world. Edible leaf mulberry, there are edible types of mulberry. Actually, there was just something in the news. Somebody died from over consuming edible leaf mulberry, maybe. Um, which is the first I've ever heard of that. People have been eating it for millennia, uh, particularly pregnant women um, uh, around the world eat edible leaf mulberry. Um, really, the leaves of any mulberry can be eaten, but some are not tasty or are really fibrous. Um, uh, so I'm going to follow up on this story and see they think it's the mulberry, but they're not actually sure. Somebody who was taking huge amounts as like a dietary supplement which we see on various kinds of vegetables. Sometimes people are poisoned by like juicing a certain vegetable and eating only that or consuming only that for, for a long period of time. It's good to mix up your, your diet. Um, but I eat quite a few of these and I really enjoy them a lot. Um, one of the world's most nutritious vegetables. Again, Chinese tune, I absolutely love this stuff. It looks like Ilanthus. It looks like tree of heaven, but it's not. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, this is the most nutritious vegetable that we can grow in cold climates as far as the, um, the deficiencies that people have. And um, it tastes just like chicken soup. It's, I've never seen anything like it. So for vegans, it's pretty nice to bring that flavor in. Um, it makes great soup stock. The tender leaves are an outstanding vegetable. It's like my favorite vegetable. I'm going to plant a huge area of it here at our new farm. Um, and um, all I do is cut it down once or twice a year to like four feet high and it regrows that nice tender growth. There used to be some nice plants at Arnold Arboretum uh, that they, they got rid of because they were too weedy there. Um, 
but if you cut it down a lot, it keeps it under, you know, if you cut it down once or twice a year, it keeps it under control pretty well in my experience here anyway. Um, and then we have the bamboo shoots, um, which there's plenty of that around in Philly already, I know, growing wild. Um, you want to be real thoughtful about where you plant bamboo, of course, um, but uh, it is a great, uh, the shoots are a great vegetable, and there is a native bamboo in the area there, uh, around an area of Gigantia, but um, the shoots are more bitter, so unfortunately, it's a great, useful bamboo, but it's not particularly great shoot bamboo as far as I understand. So these are some of our best trees with edible leaves. There are others. Uh, and then we have some trees that have like flowers or fruits that we can eat as vegetables. One of the most surprising to me is elm, both the native slippery elm uh, and the highly invasive common in cities Siberian elm have excellent fruits. This is like in the spring, they flower and then they make these little green fruits called uh, samaras or samaras in huge amounts, as you can see here. And they're just really, really delicious. They come on in such abundance that you would need to like pickle them or something to keep up with them because they make so much. My, what I will try here is planting them and cutting them down um, and maybe like cutting it every three years or so. Have three of them and cut each one, you know, once every three years because otherwise they'll get too big and be hard to harvest from. Um, but really, really surprisingly delicious. Also edible young leaves that aren't quite as good, but the, um, the fruit is really surprisingly good. Uh, goji fruit, of course, mostly the gojis grown for fruit are a different species than the ones we grow for leaves. The leaves is Lyceum chinensi and the fruit is Lyceum barbarum, although sometimes they're considered the same species and I don't know, um, but those are great, of course. Um, I don't like them raw very much, but they're nice when they're dried. Uh, yucca flowers um, and the whole kind of like flower stalk, the inflorescence when it has the, the um, unopened flower buds on it is a big vegetable throughout uh, Latin America. And even the native one there, yucca filamentosa, can be eaten that way. Um, and obviously a super tough plant for, um, for urban conditions. And finally, redbud flowers, I think are really delicious. And I would love to try pickling those as well. Again, you get so much, you couldn't possibly eat all of them. They taste just like peas. Um, and they're so beautiful. They're gorgeous in a salad. Um, so I'm looking forward to trying to grow those on a bigger scale here and try really eating them in, in, in larger volume. I've just been picking them off of street trees up until now. So those are some trees with edible flowers. And we have vines with edible leaves and shoots um grape leaves of course uh actually one of the most nutritious vegetables in the world grape leaves incredibly high in vitamin a um people also by the way use mulberry leaves stuff mulberry leaves the same way that you see with grape leaves which is an interesting way to eat those the shoots of hops quite nutritious one of the highest in vitamin e of all the world's vegetables and caucasian spinach um which is not uh, named that way for white people. It's from the Caucasus mountain region um, in sort of central Eurasia. Um, and um, it's in the spinach family. The leaves taste very much like spinach. The shoots are incredibly delicious. Um, it likes sort of part shade or full shade for the roots, but it wants the vining part to be out in the sun. And um, I think honestly, just one of the best tasting perennial vegetables we have. Really, really, really delicious. Um, <clears throat> it's actually been a bit of a pain for me to grow. It seems to want very well drained soil, so hopefully it'll do well here at my new site. Um, but a number of nurseries offer seed and plants of that now. <coughs> and um, sort of the new darling of the perennial vegetable world in some ways with, with very good reason. Um, then we have a few vines. Okay, what we really need is vines, perennial vines with edible vegetable fruit. And I just can tell you that we don't have great ones yet for this climate. There are amazing ones for the tropics, for the subtropics. Here's the two best candidates I can give you for now. Um, mouse melon is the is a commercially grown vegetable from Mexico. It makes little tiny cucumbers. Um, there is the native 
analog to that Molothria pendula, which I think this one was actually domesticated from because it grows in Mexico too. But if you let the native one get too big, it can make you sick, can make you nauseous. Whereas these are like commercially grown and marketed and stuff. It's allegedly root hardy in zone seven. It makes a tuber. Um, people report it being hardy in zone seven. So I would say that would be worth trying in protected areas, um, you know, next to your house or whatever. Um, and uh, they're really adorable. They're really adorable. And we've always wanted to take, we, we grow the native one and we've always wanted to make, take little tiny baby food jars and pickle them in the jar, you know, put them in little tiny micro, there would be like micro pickles or something. Um, I think that would be fun to do. And then there, the, there's um, there's a, a, a species of snake gourd from South Asia, it grows like in the um, Himalayas and stuff, the uh, parwal, which is um, at least hardy in zone eight and maybe hardier. Um, and there is a, a, a a nursery or seed company in New Jersey. I can't remember the name. Um, I tried to track them down. They may be out of business. They specialize in vegetables from India um, who occasionally bring it in. Unfortunately, it doesn't grow well from seed and the fruit that's sold in stores is unripe. So you can't save seed from it or grow seed from it. We've, we've tried and failed. It's really best propagated um, vegetatively and you need male and female plants to do it. So really we maybe need to get somebody to try and bring good plants from India and get them established here. But that would be one that would be potential. It's basically used like a zucchini or, or any of these, you know, unripe cucurbits. Um, and also the leaves are, are and shoots are edible on that. Um, so, um, worth exploring but frustrating um for now i've been working i've tried a whole bunch of different perennial cucurbits and they all were either horribly weedy or horribly bitter um, um still working on that perennial squash for us so any suggestions are are welcome um moving into the herbs we have some wonderful herbs with edible shoots asparagus of course uh the perennial scallions Nettles, very, very popular wild edible, and some people grow that. Hostas, actually, one of our most widely grown ornamental plants and loving shade and almost unkillable, outstanding vegetable. Commercially grown in, in Japan uh, and South Korea and in China. You just cut the shoots when they're at stage, you can see here. Um, they'll grow some more back. You can't cut it like 10 times like asparagus. You get one cutting on it usually, but because it will grow in such dense shade, um, still a great vegetable. We just cook them up and um, um, and use them in a, in a stir fry or whatever. They're great. And then we have milkweed, which is, um, I think, one of the best tasting perennial vegetables we have. Just regular common milkweed. We eat the shoots, then the young leaves, then the broccoli flower buds, then the flowers, and then the young fruit. It has to be cooked because the latex, the milk inside is poisonous. I feel like that latex, that when you cook it, it almost is like cooking it in a cream sauce. Um, the problem is there's some poison in there. Um, uh, some kind of heart related poison, which sounds really bad. I will say people have been eating it for thousands of years. Uh, and there is a researcher at the University of New Hampshire working on ex uh, exploring the toxicity, seeing if different populations had different amounts with the aim of developing it as a new domesticated vegetable. Um, I love it. Uh, but you should know that it has this... Uh, toxic component in there that um, is something you should think seriously about before experimenting with it. But again, I, I really, I'm all in on it. I'm just shocked at how good it is. And I've served it to lots of people, over a hundred different people at tours and workshops and everybody loves it and everybody's shocked at how good it is. And it's certainly not hard to grow. Um, it'll just spread and take over areas within your garden. So you can harvest some and leave some for to flower and leave some for the butterflies and so on. Um, some of the herbs that I believe is wood nettle is a great native one for shade. 
Uh, some of the chicories are perennial. There are cultivated types. Um, some of our native onions like ramps are great also for shade. Uh, Silvetta arugula is a perennial arugula, really nice in warm enough climates. It's actually a shrub. Um, here it always dies back to the ground in the winter. Um, it self sows very well also. Um, and that's like commercial. You, you can buy that at the supermarket. You can buy the leaves at the supermarket. You get served it in restaurants all the time, but people are growing it as an annual. It happens that it's a very nice perennial. And finally, we have perennial kales and collards, most of which are not cold hardy. Um, uh, but there's been a lot of, of real flurry of breeding work on that. Up here, none of them are quite hardy, although there's a new one in New York they're working with. Um, but there's a great breeders mix. There's some wonderful breeding work been doing. Maybe Nate could talk about that um, a little later. You can order this uh, kaleidoscopic Grex mix, which has a mix of tons of different genetics of perennial kales and you can plant them out and see which ones survive your winter and which ones taste good to you and whatever um and work on getting your own varieties um i've done some breeding of that here as well and none of them they would live and then a harsh winter would come and they would all die every single one of them would die so um i'm sort of following different uh, i'm trying to work with brassica napis like the red russian kale types to see if i can perennialize those instead because these are just not quite hardy here. Um, we have some great herbs with edible flower buds. On the left, there is sea kale, which is my absolute favorite. My plants are now 21 years old and going strong. And a recent effort in Vermont found that it yields more pounds of these broccolinis than asparagus in an acre. So they're very productive if they have full sun and good soil. Um, they taste great. And here they're ready in like the first week of May. For you, that might be mid to late April. Next, you can see the broccolis of those milkweeds. This is my favorite part of the whole plant. Absolutely tender, delightful, possibly poisonous, um, but really good. And then we have daylily flowers and flower buds. Of course, it's actually the lemon daylily, this yellow one that's mostly grown as a vegetable in China. So I think mostly people here eat the tawny day lily, the orange one, but it's these somewhat smaller yellow ones that are considered the best in, in their homeland. Um, there are a few of these new hardy um, artichoke varieties that I'm sure you all know better than me, which ones would grow down there. And then the, the stalk and flower bud of garlic chives, of course, which is an exception. Well, actually all of these flower buds um, uh, except for the sea kale, are midsummer. So these are some of the few perennial vegetables we have. These and the trees with edible leaves are those midsummer um, vegetables for us. And I sure wish we had a great tomato and a great eggplant, and um, and so on. Uh, summer squash for this climate that were perennial. We really don't. Um, uh, besides goji, which is not really ready uh to replace the tomato yet to me anyway um but we have perennial ground cherries including a ton of native species of perennial ground cherries which come in a husk like a tomatillo and there's the ye usually yellow sometimes other colors fruit inside um which are much stronger flavored than the annual ground cherries they're absolutely delightful um and uh, they're sticky sometimes. Some of the species, the fruit is sticky, so the husk sticks to it. It's hard to clean it. But I learned if you just run it under the sink and brush it off, all the papery stuff comes off really easy. They're outstanding uh, as a raw fruit. They're great in cook dishes. They're amazing on pizza. They make incredible fire roasted salsa. They're good in any kind of salsa. Um, and the interesting thing is they don't ripen until October and then they stay here, at least they stay edible until the last I've ever picked them is December 21st and they were still good. Actually, sometimes they survive the winter and they're still firm and good to eat in the spring. Um, so that's something I would really uh, recommend playing around with. Uh, I do have a form from New Zealand also, which is really good. I go, I grow a couple of cultivars of this, but I think there's lots of plant exploring to do to find the best of these perennial ground cherries um, and bring them into cultivation. They they run and spread like weeds. They get They are a home to striped cucumber beetles, which is bad news. 
they uh, they get uh, affected by some of the pests and diseases of the tomato family, and they can mess up your rotation because they're perennial and weedy. Those are all disadvantages, but um, I feel like these should be in every garden. I just absolutely love them, love them, love them, love them. Um, okay, so where do you go if you want to learn more? Let me see how we're doing on time. We're doing perfect. Well, I wrote this book on perennial vegetables a while ago now, which has some good stuff in it. Um, Martin Crawford's perennial vegetables book is great. And while mine also looks at tropical things, his is really just focused on temperate climates. I definitely recommend it. Mine is lovely too, don't get me wrong, but his book is great. Um, it's for Europe, but it very much is relevant here. Stephen Barstow's Around the World in 80 Plants, I think is just really lovingly done. He's a great speaker. If you ever get the chance to see him, he's in Norway, um, but he comes and tours the US sometimes. He has the world record for the most biodiverse salad with something like 500 species in his salads. He's the extreme salad man. Um, uh, uh, turning from books for a moment to social media, I absolutely love Alexis Nicole. Um, on TikTok and YouTube, who is a really outstanding um, uh, expert in wild edible plants, including a lot of perennial vegetables. I just tried for the first time Kentucky coffee bean peas, the unripe seeds of Kentucky coffee bean, which is in like every parking lot in, in Philadelphia. Um, she calls them mastodon beans, and I was really surprised how much I liked them. Um, so she she knows the science, she knows the Latin names, she knows how to forge them, she knows how to cook them, she gives cooking ideas. She's um, uh, uh, really an outstanding resource for a lot of these things. Um, uh, on the bottom left, there's that uh, the peer reviewed article that I wrote, which you can download for free um, from the Public Library of Science. Um, and gives sort of like a global perspective, scientific perspective. And then I have a couple of books coming up. Next week, I'm publishing a, um, sort of like a 20 pager where we tested the nutrient composition of a bunch of perennial vegetables we didn't have data on. And that was working with um, a team here in the US, a team in Sweden and a team in Denmark. So really looking across the cold climates. Um, uh, or some cold climates. Um, I'm working on a book on trees with edible leaves, a manual on growing trees with edible leaves that should be out um, by uh, um, this winter sometime. That'll be a free download. Uh, I have one we're about to submit that I wrote with a team of ethnobotanists from Mexico and analysis of all the perennial native perennial vegetables of Mexico, over 300 species native to Mexico. Some will grow here. Um, working on one with a couple of indigenous chefs about the eastern eastern North America and what was being grown here and how wild plants and ecosystems were curated and how contemporary indigenous people continue to grow and curate and use those plants and it has nutrition information and recipes and stuff. Um, and I'm working on a revised edition of perennial vegetables. It's 90% done, but it's kind of sitting in my back burner, but we'll get that out one of these days. Um, and finally, here's a bunch of um, uh, places you can buy the seeds and plants of these things. You can get asparagus and rhubarb anywhere, but most of these are very hard to come by. Um, I used to run a perennial vegetable seed company back 22, we shut down 22 years ago. Um, but, uh, there are so many good places, uh, to get these plants and it's so most of these are really tiny operations and it's really important to, to, um, to support their work. Like, I don't know what the current statistic is, but it used to be that like 90 or 95% of the diversity of food plants in the U S was in these, you know, this handful of tiny micro companies, <coughs> excuse me. And I suspect that's very much still the case. Nate could speak more to that because he's uh, in, in that world and I'm not anymore. Um, so uh, we have some time for, uh, you know, questions and stuff. So um, I think that's right just about where we wanted to be for that. And I'm happy to talk and talk and talk about this stuff. Um, uh, and I think they're going to um, throw me questions from the... Yeah.
from yeah. the chat. Thank you so much, Eric. I am, um, I'm sparked. I'm interested. I want to grow these things and play with them. Great. There's lots oh. of them, and some of them yeah. taste really good. Some of them don't taste so good. I didn't put those in the top. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. They're great. We should grow more of them. Yeah. So mulberries was something that was like people are interested in. And I think you've kind of answered like, yes, all of them, but not all of them are worth eating, maybe. I could um, say a little more about that. Yeah, if you especially want. maybe paper mulberries people wanted to know. Okay. Actually, uh, in South Korea, they do eat paper mulberry, which is a different genus. Um, uh, and it would be one way to help keep it under control, I suppose. But again, if it's just growing, you know, like in your on your block, you want to make sure that it's not growing in soil with lead or something. Um, and I wouldn't particularly recommend planting it on purpose for most of us, although the fruit is edible, too, and is uh, barely sort of kind of OK, is my my thought. I, but in terms of the, the white mulberries and black mulberries and red mulberries uh, and their mini hybrids, um, it's just a matter of going out and, and sampling them, cooking them and seeing which ones both have good flavor and good texture and then bringing those into cultivation. There's a place, one of the um, nurseries I have on there is called Just Fruits and Exotics. They are the first place I know in the U.S. that offers a mulberry specifically selected for its edible leaves. It's called edible leaf mulberry. Um, so you could save some time by starting with that one. Um, but also, I think there's so many of them, like in my city, they're coming up in every parking lot. So I just went around and tried a bunch. And also you can buy seedling mulberries from some nurseries. You can buy a bundle of like a hundred of them for 25 cents a piece, grow those out and pick which ones you like and, and, and start to grow them. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do to, to find the good um, mulberries, but they're outstanding, nutritionally speaking. They're, they're good, but not spectacular. I've never had a spectacular one to eat, but they're good. They're fine. They make a great spanakopita. They make a really good lasagna. I like them. Eric, I have a quick follow up on the mulberries. Do you harvest them at any stage or are the young leaves better? They have to be young and tender. And if you coppice them, they'll stay young and tender for like four or five months. I've even had them as late as October still good. Um, but otherwise, all these tree leaves, if they're not from coppiced plants, they give you like two weeks of leaves and then they're too tough to eat. So you can't have a mulberry for both leaves and fruit. Right. You sort of have to pick one or the other, which is a bummer. My other question related to that was about lead and wondering if what research you've seen or are you just cautious about eating any leafy part of a plant that may be in lead soil i just assume that eating leafy plants grown in lead soil is not a great idea having grown on a lot of lead soil here we we eat the fruit and don't worry about that but leaves i yeah okay thank you can you just clarify what a coppiced plant is? Sure. Okay. Maybe you remember there was a picture for everyone. Yes. Maybe all of you will remember there was a picture of a tree that was cut down about this high that was sending out new shoots. So this is like either right close to the ground or at whatever height you like cutting the whole thing back every year or every few years. And then those will send up like you'll see like like along a chain link fence, you look at where the mulberries and the ailanthus are and stuff that people tried to cut back and it's coming back whoosh and putting on 12 feet a year of these intense re sprouts. Um, those are, that's basically how we manage trees with edible leaves everywhere in the world um, uh, because that regrowth is, stays tender for a really long time. So that seems to be whether it's like baobab in Africa or uh, moringa in India or in the Caribbean or nopali cactus in Mexico, you're cutting back hard to get that. No matter where you may be, that's what people do, um, which is fascinating that no matter where you are, that's what people, sometimes people grow them in hedgerow, but it's this intense hard pruning of various kinds seems to be what, um, what 
how people mostly manage these things. Also, you don't have to climb a tree to pick the leaves that way, which is good because some of them will get 70 feet tall on their own and that's a little more than I want to do to pick leaves myself. Yeah, what yeah, else? Definitely. Um, on the same train is what is the best tasting leaf in the world that you've tasted? As oh, of, of, of any kind of leaves? I think, no, yeah, tree leaf, I think. Tree leaf, ooh. Um, Temperate or tropical. Honestly, there's one there's a there's one called tree purslane. It's a kind of salt bush, a woody salt bush that tastes just like pretzels. It's really salty. It's like salty spinach. I love that. Um uh I really like chaya, which is one from Mexico uh, and Guatemala. Um I don't actually like moringa flavor very much. It's pretty strong. And I love this chicken soup leaf. I really really just love it. At first, I thought it was way too strong, but now I'm just, it has umami, right? It, it tastes like meat. That's amazing. And I'm trying to eat less meat. So I appreciate that. Yeah, those would be some. There's another one called Ofenga from the Pacific Islands, which is in, domesticated in the Solomon Islands, grown widely as the ornamental in the tropics, including in Florida, that is like super, super good. That won't give you much luck in Philly, except as a house plant, maybe, but yeah. Um, one last question about tree leaves is, do you have anything to say about maple leaves? Yeah, actually, um, well, some maples are kind of toxic, like red maple is pretty toxic to horses. Um, but the Japanese maples, you know, those red ones with the sort of cannabis looking leaves on them, you can eat those in the spring. They're sour and good for like, three days before they get too tough, but they would be interesting to experiment with coppicing. Um, there are also some people who eat some birch leaves, um, at least on the West Coast of the US, but, but I experimented with any of our just nice seen nothing written about it. So that would be cautious at best. Cool, thank you. Beach leaves too, actually you can eat young beech leaves. They're sour too. Again, very short season on those, but. Cool. Um, okay, moving away from tree leaves. Jen Butler, hi, Jen Butler. Uh, when you say a plant is weedy, do you mean that it grows like a weed or that it is highly susceptible to having weeds grow around? Well, I mean, it grows like a weed and some of these really do grow like weeds, including some of the native ones like milkweed. Um, but uh, we do want to be thoughtful about that. Thank you. Um, so Nate Kleiman also says that about the person who ate too much uh, mulberry leaf, that he read that she likely died from dehydration caused by gastroenteritis, but they found a white mulberry leaf in her stomach, so they're blaming the mulberry. Right, I just read this today, so major grain of salt. People have been eating it forever, but I certainly wanted to mention that somebody died maybe from that. It seems like something I should say to be responsible, but um, I've never heard of anyone having any problem with them and people have eaten them for thousands of years. So thanks, Nate. Yes. Nate, do you want to jump in here and talk about the kaleidoscope kale mix that was mentioned? Sure. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's a really exciting um, seed that's been the best seller on the EFN um, from the EFN seed store for the last few years. Um, really, head and shoulders above everything else. It's um, it comes from breeder Chris Homanix out in uh, Washington State. Now he did a lot of the work living in Oregon, and um, it comes from a chance double flowering of. Uh, uh, purple tree collard and Daubenton kale, which is a small leafed perennial kale from Europe. Um, and they happen to flower at the same time at a guy in a guy's garden in Wales. And um, he had a bunch of other brassicas flowering at the same time. And Chris got a hold of the seeds a decade or more ago. And he's been he's been messing with it for a while. There's a lot of wild perennial kales collards out in the Pacific Northwest that have just naturalized. Um, it, it 
uh, perennial kale used to be a, a more common thing that people would grow in their gardens. Uh, often they would grow it for animal feed. They, they weren't necessarily selected for, um, for flavor, for human consumption. Um, but so Chris, Chris has gone looking for these and, and brought all of this perennial uh, brassica genetics together. And um, every year he's doing more selections and um, taking, his, taking cuttings from his best ones to make sure they survive. And he's getting, uh, the, the mix is getting cold hardier every year. So he's very excited about the new batch of seeds that'll be coming out. And um, people, you know, a lot of people who buy seeds from us just, just love it. And um, we have had people who, who mulch the roots have had it over winter successfully in uh, in Minnesota in in Detroit and in some very very cold places so you know there's there's so much diversity in there i think the only way to really to to find ones for those extreme climates is to grow you know 100 plants at least or 500 plants and see which ones do the best but uh, yeah that uh, that that's the long and the short of it we have a whole write up on the on the website, efnc.com. Quick follow-up. Uh, what do we know about pest problems with the perennial kales? Uh, All of them. We have harlequin yeah. beetles that are a big problem for that whole family here. I, haven't, I did notice when the one time we did grow some sea kale, which is not in the same family or not as closely related that they didn't seem to affect that, but. Sea kale is real tough. Yeah. Um, for me, all the perennial kales got all the, yeah, all the stuff just as bad. And you can't rotate them. So in terms of disease, it's uh, you know, a little sketchy maybe as well. But um, uh, yeah, we you know they'll get aphids and cabbage worms and all that kind of stuff <laughs> i haven't found a maybe you have a better answer to this but my experience they they get all that stuff just like regular kale does yeah 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 they definitely there it's a challenge to keep them alive in the summer i think the best strategy if you're trying to to grow them here is to grow them uh grow them start them under a row cover and then um start them in the in the summer under a row cover and get like a fall crop, and then that gives them the best chance of surviving uh, into the next year. But but yeah, the harlequin bugs, the cabbage loopers, the cabbage moths are all, uh, as with pretty much every other brassica, they're they're just terrible in the in the heat this summer. But sea kale, yeah, we've had the same experience. Sea kale, um, the the harlequins do eat a little bit from it, but it can stand up to it, and they don't like it as much as they like the other ones. I have the same follow-up question. So you could you just cut it to the ground when it's got like two infested and they would keep living? We Maybe. did some of that. <laughs> yeah, you can do some of that. It just then it's real slow to come back from that. It's not doesn't come back as vigorously as like a mulberry tree you cut to the ground or something. Um the other thing with it is it's kind of late emerging in spring. So um, it doesn't have that complementary season to annual vegetables in this. It's basically around the same amount of time, same season that annual kale is around, um, which it was which was a bummer. And also we would get slugs and groundhogs on it a lot in the spring. So it would get kind of a slow start from that. I really believe in it. I really love it. I just haven't been able to make it work for me yet. That's all. I grow the I grow the tender ones in my greenhouse very successfully. Tree collards is like an unkillable, amazing plant, but um, just haven't haven't cracked the code yet myself on the perennial kale. But I think the 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 um this mix, this kaleidoscope mix, is absolutely. If everybody planted out a hundred of those, and well, once you have one, you can grow them from cuttings real easily. So it's just a matter of a bunch of us trying it and finding which ones are the most resistant to pests, maybe growing a field of a thousand of them and not spraying at all and doing no pest control and seeing who survives. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about a, uh, I, I found 
uh, Gullah Geechee tree collard that was um, originally grown by, by Gullah Geechee people in the Sea Islands off Georgia and South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a lot of the similar similar climate relatively to, to where we are, uh, in, at least in South Jersey, um, and similar pests. So uh, I, I got a cutting of that to Chris, and so he's he's adding that to the population. So in, in, in a few years, we'll have some more uh, hot Southeast genetics um, in, mixed into that Pacific Northwest uh, rex. Great, great. What else? Bonetta, did you want to throw something in there? Yeah, I'm, uh, thank you so much, uh, Eric. This is amazing. Um, really enjoying it. You made a statement about tree collard. And can I get you to go back and talk about those I have tried uh, from the uh, project uh, tree collard? And I got both seeds. I got ones that were already started and the ones that were like, little stop of something I guess and uh, I lost one uh, a few uh, days ago uh, they began uh, getting attacked by the um, cabbage loopers so what are your thoughts on tree color well um they do get they do get cabbage loopers and they get uh, aphids in the fall for us in the greenhouse um, the main thing is they've just been killed by cold for us even at 20 degrees they have died for me 20 above zero they have died for me so um i would love to be able to grow them here i think they're they're especially as a greenhouse crop for me they're tender all winter long they grow actively all winter long even in like february they're actively growing and putting on new leaves all the time um i can't say enough good things about them but um, I wish you good luck getting them to survive the winter there. Have you got them through a winter yet? No, I just uh, started. Uh, I'm in Maryland, uh, near D.C., so I understand they could be hardy in, in uh, 8 through 10. And I grew up with them in California when I was a child, so I'm praying that they survive. I wish so you the best of luck. The best of <laughs> luck. I do. <laughs> They're wonderful. They're just the best. They're the best. And they're beautiful. <laughs> they are. They're gorgeous. They're gorgeous. Yeah. All right. We're going to zoom out and then we got a bunch of like, what do you think about this plant? Um, so Kata Young says, which perennial vegetables have you identified that show the greatest promise to introduce as alternative specialty crops to help transitional conventional vegetable production to perennialized agriculture practices. Sure. Um, well, the, the system we're on with folks in Sweden and Denmark working on that, and actually the partner here uh, in Vermont and Maine is working on that too, and they've identified the commercial ones with potential here are hosta, Caucasian spinach, and sea kale partly because they're already like stuff people know. You're not making somebody eat a mulberry leaf. That's really weird. Or something that tastes like chicken soup. That's really weird to people. But broccoli is broccoli. And something that tastes like spinach, that looks like spinach, that's not a hard sell. Um, and I think they're probably that's probably good advice. It, it depends on how you're like, if you have a CSA, there's already weird stuff in there. Nobody knows what to do with. So you can just put them in and nobody will, nobody knows what a, what a celeriac is either. Right. So it sort of depends on what your market is. Um, I think that the ones that have rated as particularly nutritious could be a really interesting marketing angle as well. I think you could get chefs interested in that. I think you get some other kinds of folks interested in that. Um, those would be some some thoughts. I don't understand why everybody doesn't need them all the time. So I'm not, in some ways the wrong person to ask. Um, and I, I think also actually a number of the ones from temperate Asia have potential marketing to Asian restaurants, to Korean restaurants, to Chinese restaurants, to Japanese restaurants. Um, um, where folks know, at least if they're from the right part of those countries, they may know what to do with those already and have some market potential there. I think that's a possibility. 
there's a place near me that grows um, the the soup leaf tree and sells it to Chinese markets all over the country, for example. So I think there's some, if you can get a good enough price, I think there's some potential there for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. And, um, I had a question. I feel like um, we all have maybe some ideas, but could you just spell out like, why is perennialized kale better than me just having annual kale? Okay, the main reason in that particular case, besides that it's cool and you can brag about it, is that um, because it's coming back from roots every year, it never has that state after the first year, it never has that seedling stage where like one slug comes along and it's gone. Or you forget to water it one day and it dies. It's coming back from stronger roots, so it's just a more robust plant, especially in that spring period. Um, which is, um, it's really easy to lose plants when they're seedlings, <laughs> even if you're planting out transplants, they're just more vulnerable. So, um, uh, that would be the reason to me, I guess, to do that. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And it's um, less work. Although you're still having to do the pest control and stuff, but you don't have to till if you mulch it, it just comes up through the mulch and you're good to go. So it's less, less trouble, I think, less labor. Um, okay, so Gavin Hardy says, love this presentation. Eric, what do you think of cardoons at Beacon Food Forest in Seattle? There is a cardoon forest. Sure, cardoon is great. I mean, it's real thorny. Cardoon is a kind of artichoke that you eat the, the leaf stem of, the petiole. It's very bitter. It's sort of an acquired taste a little bit, and it, it is one of the world's worst invasive weeds. With that said, hey, buddy, that's my son, Daniel. <laughs> um, what's up, honey? You just want to say hi to everybody here? What have you been doing out there? Badminton. Badminton, awesome. For a long time. I'll be off of here in about uh, 10, 15 minutes. I'll come play, all right? You need a little water here? No, it's Okay, welcome. So, car, so to me, cardoon um, is great if you like bitter and spiny, and 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 um, it is a gourmet vegetable, definitely marketable. Um, um, with those caveats, the flowers are to die for. Also, really beautiful flowers. It's basically the wild ancestor of artichoke, so it has these huge thistle heads that are stunning, stunning, beautiful plant all around. Um, yeah. Um, okay, Nate Anderson wants your thoughts on mallow. Oh yeah, uh, they're great. They're in that, that okra is in that family. Uh, Linden, baobab are all in that family. So these are all things with like slimy leaves that make a great thickener for stews. Some of the mallows are extremely nutritious. Um, mine kept getting rust and they died. So I haven't been growing it for a number of years, but I really like it. And in, in the Pacific Northwest, the, some of the mallows like Malva Moshada are evergreen and keep growing tender new growth all winter long. And I sure like the sound of that a lot. Um, and some of them are really beautiful and you can eat the flowers too. So certainly, um, yeah, those are great. Those are some of the couple of hundred species that I didn't get to put in this presentation and very much worthy of, of growing, especially if you like that thickener uh, you know, in Africa, most vegetables thicken stew like that, and that's a really important, desirable trait. In other places, people don't want slimy vegetables at all. So it's Malamar spinach, same thing, real, real mucilaginous like that. It's just a matter of personal taste. Um, okay, one more. What do you think about is ground nuts? Okay. Um, I really want to love ground nut patriotically. It's a native one. It has edible tubers. Um, you can also eat the young leaves and the flowers. Some forms make edible seed, like a dry bean. And I've got some of those going here finally after 25 years of looking for them. Um, as a root crop, what I have found about them is that they sucker all over the place. They run all through the garden, which I find annoying in my small garden. Um, 
and and it's hard to find enough tubers in any one place as a result so they're sort of weedy everywhere but nowhere concentrated enough to eat um and i've tried growing the improved varieties with larger tubers they all died here but you all are very fortunate to have um dale hendricks at green light plants so close by who has grown out like all the very best improved varieties of brown nut and found the ones that grow well uh, right on the Delaware border and produce good tubers that are close to the base of the plant. So that's totally where to go for good ground nut varieties. I like eating them, they taste nice, um, but I just haven't found the way to grow them that actually works for me um, in my heart. Eric, I just want to tip you off to Alex Wenger, uh, a Fields Edge research farm in Lancaster County. He's Great. worked He's working with um, all that original uh, germplasm that that Dale has of, of the ground nuts and, and a whole bunch of other new stuff. And he's planting out hundreds of plants every year, growing them on black plastic and figuring out figuring out how to do some field production here right. in, in southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, I, I love it. Edge, it's called. I love it. Thank you. And I'll just tell a story about that for a moment. So ground nut, it looks like the native range went right up around to Connecticut um, and uh, improved varieties were selected by indigenous women thousands of years ago um, that were sterile hybrids. A lot of our root crops are sterile and don't make fruits like they don't make viable seed. They focus their energy on the roots. So these forms that were selected have good sized roots and um, don't make seed. So all of the ground nuts north of Connecticut and they grow way up into Canada, way, way, they're zone hardy to zone three, way up into Canada. So a huge area, I don't know, I wanna say seven to 10 times the size of all of Pennsylvania is full of these, as ground nuts grow all over the place, all through this area, all of New England, much of, you know, Eastern Canada, are all one or two cultivars of ground nut that were selected and transported by indigenous women over the course of thousands of years. And we just look at them up here and we think they're weeds, but they are cultivars that were intentionally moved around and planted so that they would grow um, and be a food source over a huge, huge area. Um, and uh, that's one of many stories that we're working on telling uh, in, in this book that we're working on that we just got some money to work on. Um, so it's certainly historically a really important plant um, uh, in, of the East and, and, and something that we should be paying more attention to now. And I'm glad some people are doing that. I'm working on it as a dry bean. I'm interested in it as the perennial dry bean. I'm still looking for the perfect perennial bean up here. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah, well, I think we've worked our way to the bottom of the questions, but I thought maybe to finish out, you could just tell us about one growing project you have going on that you're excited about, how it's going. Oh, yeah, um, let's see. Um, what's especially good? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, hmm. Here at our new home. Well, okay, this is sort of a it's actually more of a fruit related one, but I we've been working on a lot of people have been trying to find the best hardy varieties of the native passion fruit, the maypop, which you can eat the fruit of, but also the leaves are a nice vegetable. Um, and I've been able to get some to overwinter and flower, but not set fruit, but I've never had two at the same time. I finally now have to my knowledge the the two very most northernmost varieties of this. Um, growing in a greenhouse, so they will cross, um, and I will be able to offer seed through the experimental farm network of these um, exceptionally cold hardy genetics of maypop, which like ground nut, run, it's a, a vine that runs and suckers all through the garden, which is like super annoying, <laughs> but it's a passion fruit that we can grow. So we got the flowers are you know unbelievably beautiful it has all these great medicinal uses it's a nice vegetable 
um, uh, it's a great fruit. So um, I'm really, really happy about that. That's like the first thing I planted in my new greenhouse here um, at the farm. That's exciting. Thank you. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Eric. This was very inspiring. And I'm so excited that we will have the slides and the recording to share with everybody. Because I'm sure we could all do with a couple listens through. Um, Phil, any last words? I just, I really appreciate the opportunity. I love talking about this. It was interesting to sit down and realize I'm working on four written pieces about perennial vegetables <laughs> right now. There's a lot more to say. There's a lot more to learn. It's, we're still, there's so much, um, so much to be done. Um, and I think uh, um, they're a really interesting addition to orchards and, and, um, and urban gardens. So I think they have a lot of promise. They've certainly been in our urban garden, we grew 70 species of perennial vegetables with ed just with edible leaves. Um, so um, they don't take up as much room as the fruit tree. They're mostly a lot smaller, so you can fit a lot more of them in. And, um, and I think they're, uh, um, they should be part of every food garden. Yeah, I'm excited to work on that. Great, great. Yeah.